This is a presentation from Winchester Academy. Welcome to Winchester Academy's Virtual Fall Series. My name is Suzanne Wozniak, and I'm the secretary of Winchester Academy. Thank you for tuning in. We are grateful to the city of Wapaka, and especially to Josh Werner, for making this space available to us and for providing the technology to make all of this happen. Our next program will be in one week from tonight on November 16th at 6.30 p.m. when journalist Bill Berry will give his program, A Journalist Reflects on Earth Day at 50 and the Challenges of Today. Tonight's program is sponsored by a grant from the Al and Gloria Gruer Family Fund of the Wapaka Area Community Foundation. As many of you know, Gloria served as a trustee of Winchester Academy for many years. Al and Gloria were big supporters of many community activities and events, and we are grateful for this grant. We will have a Q&A session following Jack's presentation on the continuing popularity of Westerns, Question may be submitted via the Facebook Live site or by telephone. The phone number is 715-942-9917. Please hold your questions until the end of the program. That phone number again, 715-942-9917. Jack Rhodes earned his Ph.D. from the University of Texas at Austin and held faculty positions at Colorado College, the University of Utah, and Miami University in Ohio, where he served as chair of the Department of Communication and as executive director of Miami's Hamilton campus. At Miami, he taught a graduate class in rhetoric of film and now serves as a seminar teacher of film studies at Lawrence University's York London campus in Door County. Welcome, Jack. Welcome. Thank you, Suzanne, for the introduction. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I appreciate that. I also want to thank the Winchester Academy, of course, and all of you who can be here in the audience with us tonight and all listening by other mechanisms. And I also want to thank Josh, of course, and Kathleen Daly, who is advancing the slides, and we're ready to go. I'm going to talk at you for the first 45 or 50 minutes, and then, as Suzanne said, we'll have question and answer afterward for about 15 minutes. In the movie Havana, that's an odd place to start, but in the movie Havana, 1990, uh, Robert Redford, and of course he did his own westerns, Jeremiah Johnson, Butch Cassidy, etc. Robert Redford, as a character, says to his girlfriend, Lena Olin, they're talking about the movies, he's making coffee, and he says... I like Westerns, you know. I don't really know what they have to do with anything. I just like them. And I thought that was a good enough place to start because I think a lot of people who do like Westerns have that kind of visceral reaction. They're, they're just something to enjoy, something to escape to, and they don't have to really be so much about anything. And yet, as we go through this talk, we'll find out that they are. I think they endure because they are about duty, honor, responsibility, and other classic virtues that are indeed um, shown as we go through the movies and that endure today, or at least we certainly hope they do. Of course, this is a large topic, and so I have some time constraints, and I thought I should mention the parameters right away. I'm a film critic and scholar, as Suzanne's introduction said, and not really able to talk very much about a lot of Western novels due to the time constraints in passing, We'll say something about them. And the second thing is there are scads of television westerns, and we'll talk about some of them in passing, but this talk is not about those either. This is really about western movies. So I am covering and focusing particularly on the heyday of westerns, which was the classic era. Now, for those who don't know or remember, uh, film critics have divided the periods of time in which we work to the silent era, the beginnings to 1927. And then with the advent of sound, we go to the classic era, 
and that runs until 1968. In 68, you have a dropping of the production code, and you have other factors, a release in 67 of Clint Eastwood's Fistful of Dollars that cause us to uh, stop and uh, end, you might say, the era of classic movies. And for the record, the period then from 68 to 2000 is the modern era, and 2000 to the present day, the contemporary era. Well, that's true for all films, not just Westerns. But the Westerns really flourished in two periods, the silence, of which there were quite a number, but not a scad. And then, of course, when we get farther along, you get to the period of the classic era where the Western really, really flourished. And so I thought we would talk about that, and that would show us a little bit about what we needed to understand about Westerns. Also, Westerns are of two types, even among the movies. They are the A Westerns, meant to be released on their own, movies you know and have seen like Shane and High Noon, Johnny Guitar, Tall T, etc., and the B Westerns running in a concurrent track, the ones that are down at the bottom of the bill, the so-called because if there was a double feature, that, of course, was the B movie, the second half of the double feature. Lower budgets, shorter running times, not such big stars, typically in black and white, We'll say a little bit about those as we go. All right. I always like to stop and define terms a little bit so you know where we are and the parameters and what we are going to talk about and what we're not. Western. In the dictionary, if you go to any reliable dictionary, take Webster's, it is the ninth meaning that we need to go to. First, they talk about directions and so forth, and then they get to the Western, capital W. A story, movie, television play, etc., about the U.S. West of the 19th century, especially about cowboys, westward migration, Indian wars, etc., etc. Therefore, since I'm using this definition, 19th century United States, we will be even narrower, even as we acknowledge variations. You know the variations, modern westerns. Bad Day at Black Rock, for example. Western set overseas or in Mexico. Quigley Down Under, Way of a Gaucho, The Magnificent Seven. Are those Western? Sure. But they're not the main focus for the dictionary or for scholars. They are variations. So we will think about those. And even early 20th century produced some Westerns or set there. The Shootist, with John Wayne, taking place in 1901, which is technically. 20th century. So we are aware of those. We will go forward with those. We acknowledge them, but I'm still focusing on the classic era. Okay. Then if we've defined Westerns, what do I mean by endure? And I'm very methodical about those things. I wanted to be sure you had the right notion, so I go to the dictionary again. And the first kind of message on the word endure that you find would be what I would call a verb transitive, not to throw the terms at you, when it's endure something. Like you might say, John McCain endured being a prisoner of war, okay? Or you might say, to sustain or undergo, as the dictionary says, without impairment or yielding, standing up for something, like Man of La Mancha, to dream the impossible dream. And so you would have an enduring kind of dream to bear without resistance, like POWs. Or you can use it as a verb intransitive on its own, as we are in this title, why Westerns endure to continue to exist, to last into the future. Examples dictionary gives the Bible, the works of William Shakespeare. So why Westerns endure? Now that starts with a question, do they or don't they? How many modern Westerns are there? How many have you seen made? How many play the Rosa and the theater complexes in normal times in Appleton. How many are on television that are new, not reruns or recycles? Not so terribly many. So they do endure, but they're not as center stage or prevalent as they were during the period that we're going to focus on. So we're going to exclude, as I said earlier, countless television series of the 50s and 60s, which were there to complement in part the movies that we're showing in the Western movies. And many of the times when NBC and CBS, ABC started showing movies on television in the 60s, what did they go to? Westerns, you know, John Wayne Westerns. Those were very popular. 
They started to make their own TV movies, uh, The Dangerous Days of Kiowa Jones. This supplemented Tales of Wells Fargo, Bonanza, Cheyenne, Gunsmoke, Laredo, Stories of the Century, Rifleman, Death Valley Days, and we could Paladin, have Gunwell Travel, on and on. So we have to turn to a scholarly source, Michael R. Pitt's Western Reference Book, where he catalogs each and every Western made in the United States from the beginning to 1986. 4,200 feature films, not counting television, all right? But the salient point might be more interesting to you is when he redoes that book in 2013, now first he has covered the whole century practically. He had 4,200. Now by the addition of 2013 to bring it up to date, it only gets to 5,100 because from 1986 to 2013, 27 years, only 900 more are added. If you put that in terms of average production, 1903 to 86 from The Great Train Robbery to the movies of 1986, 51 feature films are being ground out by Hollywood per year. And in the heyday, it's more than that because there were some slow years way back in the silent era. And the number of productions, 1986 to 2013, 33 a year. Many of them produced internationally or made originally for television. I think we've done enough to go through that. We want to get on to the main part of the topic, but I've just been setting the stage for you. to say, well, how can you say they endure, Jack, if you've only had 900 made in that period of 27 years, and that cut off in 2013, and you have to start thinking about a very few Westerns you've seen since. Well, I think one reason they endure is that the Westerns have at their heart a code. They are morality plays, good typically, not always, but typically in the vast majority of cases, triumphs over evil. Certain characteristics are considered brave and bold and appropriate. It's a very male-dominated uh, circumstance and genre, really, we have to accept that. And with that, male dominance comes, can certainly be extended to females, but wasn't very much, duty, honor, and responsibility. As I like to say, the heroes exemplify these qualities, the villains flaunt them. An obvious example, Kathleen, will be on our first slide from High Noon, released in 1952 and starring Gary Cooper. And I wanted to kind of mention to you couple of things about this slide that you're looking at now. For people listening on the radio, I'm sorry you can't see these, but I will mention where we are each time so you can imagine what they're looking at. You may remember some of these images. Gary Cooper in High Noon, 1952. I want you to notice on that shot that you're looking at the verticality of this shot, by which I mean there's an unusual number of posts for any little western town, they have more posts than almost any other one you'll ever see. The verticality of the shot emphasizes Cooper's lank form walking down the street. Almost an excessive use of posts, left, right, behind him, and across the street, all telling us about duty, honor, and responsibility. He has decided to stay and fight the four killers that are coming to town I'm going to assume you remember the plot. The question is, do I leave, do I stay? And we have lyrics in Dmitry Tiomkin and Ned Washington's Oscar-winning song, Do Not Forsake Me, Oh My Darling, that make that choice very clear. You know, I cannot leave, et cetera, all of that, and I must face that cold-eyed killer or lie a coward in my grave. So it's duty, honor, responsibility. And there's no question in our mind that he will survive and that he will prevail, but we have to watch it play out. And one of the ways that Fred Zinneman and his cinematographer Floyd Crosby make this movie so good and so tense is, of course, to keep showing the clocks, counting toward high noon. And every time Cooper appears, he is an image of rectitude, duty, honor, and responsibility. The next one, Kathleen, we're on to a slide of the same sort of duty, honor, responsibility in another guise. One year later, 1953, released by Paramount. And that, of course, is Alan Ladd, the classic loner in Shane. 
He will explain to Brandon DeWilda toward the end of the movie that there's no living with a killing and he has to move out of the valley. Notice this about Shane in this still shot. We're looking at Alan Ladd face on for the radio audience. The enigmatic half smile, serious yet smiling. He's friendly, he's approachable, but he's all business. He has a prominent large revolver in the scene. You can't miss it. He has a rope in the scene. He has a distant horizon behind him. So we have a visual component that shows us that this is the hero and these are his characteristics. He means business, but he can be friendly. He can say things with a smile, but don't mess with him. He has the duty, the honor, the responsibility. The next slide shows more than one person. This is from the 1957 Columbia picture, 310 to Yuma. And we have here the trio, the classic sort of trio, representing duty, honor, and responsibility. First, the bad man, Glenn Ford, the villain. If you look closely, he is handcuffed. They have him captured. They're going to put him on the 310 train to Yuma. In the middle, a character actor you probably don't know as well, named Robert M. Hart, who was popular in his day. He plays Mr. Butterfield. He's the owner of the stage line, and he has vowed to make all arrangements to help Van Heflin get Glenn Ford on the 310 to Yuma. You can tell by the softness of the character's face that he is concerned, that he wants to help, but when push comes to shove, he may not be the one to stand up a little too soft, a little too pudgy. There he is in the trio. And Van Heflin, the hero, wary, vigilant, and notice he has the sawed-off gun. It will be his responsibility to get Glenn Ford on the train. So we have the bad, the good, and the intermediary citizen all together and the duty, honor, responsibility. No matter what, no matter the pleas from his wife, no matter other characters getting bumped off, hung, shot, whatever, Van Heflin will make every human effort to get him to that train, the 310 to Yuma. Now, we're going to leave that slide up a moment while I go ahead and talk about something else. We're going to take a little detour here, and we'll come back to the slides. But I wanted to bring to your attention an author you may or may not have ever heard of. He was, again, popular at one time in the early 20th century. His name is Frank Gruber. I don't have a slide for this, but I want to explain to you his dates are 1904 to 69. Frank Gruber was a struggling pulp writer, and he wrote lots of westerns, and he wrote lots of mystery novels, and he wrote short stories, shoot 'em ups of all kinds. And after a long time in the pulp fiction business, he published an autobiography called The Pulp Jungle in 1967, two years before he died. And I find him fascinating, and this is quoted a lot. His findings are quoted a lot in Western scholarly literature because Gruber said there are only seven basic plots for Western movies. Write as you will, there are only seven plots. You can take all of them. He's talking here about 5,100 movies. He didn't know that many, but we have that many now. And generalizing that there are only seven plots. He says you can work variations, but this is what you have. Think about this, thinking of all the Westerns you've ever seen. Is he right? First, he says there's the Union Pacific story. In this kind of story, some advance in technology, typically a railroad, comes to the West and people fight to preserve it and villains try to thwart it. So you have the telegraph line in Western Union. You have the march forward in Brigham Young Frontiersman when Dean Jagger is trying to bring the Mormons across the prairie. And you have Canadian Pacific, Rock Island Trail, Kansas Pacific, Santa Fe. We can go on and on. There are more and more and more of these. Carson City, Union Pacific. They're all about Denver and Rio Grande. They're all about the involvement of the Union Pacific stories, the railroad, or some form of technology, number one. Number two, the ranch story. There's a ranch, and it is prosperous, and somebody is trying to get it, either because the railroad's about to come through, or oil has been discovered, or you name it, gold, 
tungsten, whatever, has been discovered, and so villains are threatening the ranch. And this is the kind, you can go to the channel, the Western Channel, if you watch that, Stars Channel, anytime. I turned it on only today to see if I couldn't find that. And there it was in one clip. I wasn't even looking for it. A movie called Fighting Bill Fargo, a B picture with Johnny Mac Brown and Tex Ritter. And the young lady, I don't know the actress's name, comes running in and she says, Bill, Bill, you got to help me. Mr. So-and-so is going to foreclose on the ranch. Well, he can't foreclose on the ranch. You have a legal title to that ranch. He claims we're behind in our payments. You've got to saddle up and come with the ranch story. Okay? Perfect example. And a third one, the empire story. Okay? If you're making notes, I hope you will. I'm sorry I don't have a slide prepared. The empire story, a rags-to-riches story in which somebody builds an empire. Spencer Tracy and Broken Lance, John Wayne and Red River. You get the idea. And they defended against all comers. That's sort of a variation of the ranch story, but it's similar. And that even carries into modern uh, westerns. Susan Hayward in Tulsa, where she's leading the fight to protect an oil field uh, against all comers. So, so far we have the Union Pacific story, the ranch story, the empire story, Number four is the revenge story. And that, of course, comes down even to modern Westerns like The Revenant, three or four years ago with Leonardo DiCaprio, a remake of Man in the Wilderness with uh, Richard Harris. But the same idea with the bear and all, that a man gets wronged by a supposed friend or colleague and will come back. It can be revenge for somebody who killed your parents. Think Star Wars or modern Western similarities. And it can, or your uncle and aunt, it can be somebody who has taken away the ranch, it's somebody that's tarnished your good name. Usually it's somebody who has murdered or injured some innocent person, and we're getting revenge on them. Number five, the cavalry and Indian story. This one, Gruber would have to agree where he's still alive, is a little out of date because these days not very politically correct because, as he said in 1967, the cavalry and Indian story, with rare exception, I remember he's writing in 67, is always about taming the West or the white people. Pretty observant in 1967. And we do see that in a great many of them. Now we have variations in the modern movies, Dances with Wolves, for example. Many more, Broken Arrow with Jimmy Stewart back in 1950. So that has gone by the boards, but nevertheless, cavalry and Indians in some form. Number six, the outlaw story in which following the outlaw propels the action. Jesse James, When the Daltons Rode, The Doolins of Oklahoma. You get the idea. And go on title after title after title, but we want to get on to other topics. And last but not least, the Marshalls story, High Noon. Okay? Or if not, directly uh, somebody who is a, a, a law officer, then somebody who's been thrust into the role of protecting the people like Jimmy Stewart in the far country. So now that we have those seven in mind, and I know you're probably thinking, gee, there must be more, but Gruber says what we're doing as writers is endless variations on those. And he said, very wisely, the people going to see Western movies know what they want to see. They, will, they want the genre to be intact. They will take the occasional unhappy ending. They will take the occasional variation. But basically what they want to see is that all of the components of duty, honor, and responsibility are there intact. So now we're going to move to the next slide, a movie that really turns that on its head and goes all the way different, and that is Johnny Guitar, released in 1954 by Republic. The slide we're looking at now is the classic poster for Johnny Guitar. And when you notice something in the role reversal, here is Joan Crawford with her gun strapped on. The title of the movie is Johnny Guitar, but that is not the role she plays. She plays an, a character called Vienna. This classic poster shows the role reversal and the amazing homage that Republic Studios is willing to pay to this artist. Notice her name appears not once but twice. 
Joan's Greatest Triumph, Joan Crawford in Johnny Guitar. This is unusual billing. Above the title, twice before we get there. And as we move into Johnny Guitar, these slides are in black and white. The movie is on color. Next slide, Kathleen. We're going to see a couple of contrasting slides that show duty, honor, responsibility, and sort of the ranch story. She has her property, and she's going to protect it. This is Joan on the staircase of Vienna's um, tavern and gambling hall, looking down on the crowd. Note the things the director does. Nicholas Ray, by the way, a native of Galesville, Wisconsin. His father was the mayor of La Crosse at one time. Nicholas Ray is the director, and they were looking down on the ground. She sees them down on the floor of the saloon, the slanting ceiling, the masculine stance, completely dominant, center of attention, and the variation we have is the woman. Now, this movie was popular enough in its day, though not a blockbuster, has since been picked up by the French critics who consider it the best American Western ever made. It is not that high in my estimation, but I know it would be somewhere in the top 50, in my view, and in the top 100 on the list of the American Film Institute for Best Westerns. That's where it is. Second slide of this shows the other angle. What Joan sees looking down, now she looks down on them. They've looked up to her. She's looking down on them. Notice all eyes up. There's a circle of concerned citizens. There are circle images Nicholas Ray puts in here to show the banding together of those irate citizens because Mercedes McCambridge's brother Lem has been killed by bandits and they think Joan and her crowd are responsible. There's a circle image in the lamps, in the pharaoh wheel, and there's a grisly image, if you look hard, of a body on the gaming table. Then let's go to Johnny Guitar. Next slide, please, Kathleen. The final shot. This movie has been mostly indoors, about 75%. Some of it gets outside like the typical Western, and in the final shot, which was added later, they tried to restore the emphasis of suggesting the normal, quote-unquote, sexual order. So we're outdoors in nature, and Sterling Hayden was so tall, he has to bend over here in order to embrace Joan Crawford. This is added to give us the final scene while Peggy Lee sings a love song about there was never a man like my Johnny, the man they call Johnny Guitar to try to get us back to the focus. But after all, it doesn't exactly. Now we turn to the next slide, which shows Joan on the set with Nicholas Ray, the director. They're going over the script. I include this kind of shot, and I'll have three or four more of them, because I have a sub-theme I want you to think about, that movies are in the business of fooling us, and that even Westerns are not reality. They are pretense of reality, and they are, in fact, all just doing a movie. The people responsible, the camera, the cinematographer, all doing a movie. The original line is hard to attribute, but Alfred Hitchcock used it all the time. When people said Psycho was too scary, for example, he said, oh, come on, it's only a movie. Hitchcock, right? And so we see some of these. So we're there in the business of fooling us, and we're going behind the scenes, as we are in the next slide, from Winchester 73, which is regarded as a movie that brought back the Western genre when it was flagging in 1950. Jimmy Stewart and Shelley Winters are pictured here on a break on the set on old Tucson. Note the cables down by their feet. You can see those big old cables. They had such cumbersome equipment. That movie, of course, is the lone hero on a quest to get the man who murdered his father. It's a revenge play, and you just go straight down the line to Frank Gruber's revenge play, and there you'll find it. The next slide, I wanted to do something showing the beauty of nature, takes us to Stagecoach, and we see the coach in Monument Valley with a cavalry escort. Western natural landscape dwarfing the human story, and, of course, John Wayne's breakout movie with John Ford. I'm going to go rather quickly through these John Ford pictures in the interest of time. The since Stagecoach was one of his early ones, we'll go to one of his latest westerns, though not his last, 
a man who shot Liberty Valance, released by Paramount in 62 with two of his favorite actors, James Stewart and John Wayne, along with the director, on a break on the set. Now almost no natural landscape because the movie is about the end of an era. How to classify this movie is a little difficult by Gruber's Seven, but I think the closest it comes to would be like the ranch story and the civilization of the West, and you can do it by extension. So there are exceptions. John Ford was a great director. He's on the next slide behind the camera. Note the outsized camera, that kind of outfit, and remind yourself that it's only a movie after all because here's the great director with one eye making great pictures that way. The next slide is the poster for the movie She Wore a Yellow Ribbon. This, of course, is the cavalry story released by RKO in 1949. And this movie, I think, is a brave, thrilling, romantic from the poster, and it's going to be all of that. But while we are looking at She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, Jack would like to take a little detour from this classic A movie, The Cavalry and Indian Story, and detour just a few moments, probably four minutes, through the classic B Western. The B Western had people like Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, Hopalong Cassidy, John A. McBrown, Wild Bill Elliott, and I thought I would take one that you might not know and let him stand for all the B Western heroes. This next slide is of George O'Brien. I don't know the audience how many remember him or ever saw a movie. His dates are from uh, 1900 to 1985. I'm going to give you a little bit more background than usual. But note in the picture we are seeing, folks, the resolute eyes, the strong chin, the gun and its shadow prominently featured. So it almost looks like two guns. You see that shadow? He would come back in character roles and play the commandant, Major Allred, in She Wore a Yellow Ribbon. And that's why I'm detouring here at this time. Wayne also, Ford also used him in Ford Apache and his last Western, Cheyenne Autumn. He used him in one of his first Westerns, The Iron Horse. George O'Brien is an interesting figure. He should be better known. Classic movie buffs know about him. In a minute, you will know a little also. In World War I, O'Brien was he's born in 1900 now in San Francisco. His dad was the city police chief. O'Brien was the heavyweight champion of the Pacific Fleet in boxing. Okay, 1924, he made the Iron Horse for John Ford. He was an unknown, picked out of obscurity. His biggest claim to fame was being a stuntman and an extra. By 1927, he's in F.W. Murnau's dramatic triumph, Sunrise, one of the best classic silent movies. And then he went to making westerns in 1930s. The 20th Century Fox and then RKO billed him. You look at his physique there as the chest because they thought he was so muscular, and they would insist that he started to take his shirt off in most movies. That was just the way they did it in those days. After Clark Gable took his shirt off and it happened one night, that became a big thing for a little while. Then O'Brien goes back to the Navy in World War II, and now he is born in 1900. He's over 40, and he reenlists and is accepted back in the Navy, heavily decorated. Not having had enough of the military life, he volunteers to go to Korea as a cinematographer and director of war films and winds up his career after that in Vietnam and the same thing. So he served in all of those conflicts in some way. In the meantime, in the 1930s, George O'Brien made 48 B-Westerns, almost all of them made in seven to eight days that fast. They could whip them out that fast. And there'd be no way we could read all of these, but I will just mention to you, Lone Star Ranger, Riders of the Purple Sage, Robber's Roost, Frontier Marshal, O'Malley of the Mounties, Arizona Legion, Bullet Code, etc., etc., etc. I chose him because I thought you all would already probably knew about Gene Autry, Hopalong Cassidy, but maybe you didn't know George O'Brien. So we'll continue with She Wore a Yellow Ribbon. Oh, the social responsibility part, the B Western, is nothing but social responsibility. Those were made for kids. They were made for Saturday matinees, second half of a bill, and they had a code of conduct that Gene Autry articulated. 
and they had Roy Rogers was always a sheriff, a land agent, uh, an insurance investigator, whatever it was, he always played Roy Rogers in almost all his movies, and he always put things to rights, and he stopped for moral lessons to the kids, as did Hopalong Cassidy and the others, just almost turning stage front and giving the message. The morals were very clear. Uh, Dale Evans says in Twilight in the Sierras, tell us, Roy, what do we do if we find counterfeit currency in our community? Well, Dale, the way to tell the difference, and he pulls out a big chalkboard thing with a $20 bill, et cetera, to be Western and social responsibility. She wore a yellow ribbon, next slide, 1949. John Wayne, Monument Valley on patrol, move right along, number 17 slide. Uh, she wore a yellow ribbon. Now, in this case, more reflective. Folks on the radio were looking at a picture of John Wayne against the natural landscape. We should be on the next slide, Kathleen. There we are, right there. Um, the gentle fog of memory, Monument Valley in the background, see the fog rolling in. He's standing at the fence, which marks the edge of civilization. This is a favorite motif of John Ford. He uses in Stagecoach, Wagon Master by Darling Clementine. Every Western he can fit it in, there's a fence at the edge of civilization. So there's John Wayne at the end of his career, not uh, Wayne, but his character, about to retire. Nathan cutting brittles and looking out at his career and his wife has died and, and the valley and the fog and it's all pulled together. And this won the Academy Award for Winton Hoke for Best Cinematography. And as we move past these movies that have been straightforward examples, 310 to Yuma, High Noon, Shane, She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, you can see duty, honor, responsibility all over the landscape. There are some special examples that I won't have time to talk about a lot. Bud Bedecker made those wonderful Randolph Scott Westerns in which that's it, duty, honor, responsibility. Scott is not usually a lawman, and it's usually a revenge plot, but he is going to bring the villains to justice in a laconic, satisfactory, no-nonsense way. And then, of course, parodies. Whenever a genre gets to parodying itself, it is close to the end of its cycle. And so we have, in the late 60s, Cat Ballou, Support Your Local Sheriff, Support Your Local Gunfighter, Waterhole Number 3, and on television, a character that would be very popular and have little social responsibility, Maverick, played by James Garner. He would run from a fight whenever he could. But our next slide takes us to high noon again. And here we are looking at the poster that gets us directly back to our topic. The determination in Gary Cooper's eyes, the visage, the depiction of the chin. Cooper won the Oscar for this depiction in this movie. And I think it shows everything we need to know, including that slogan, the story of a man who was too proud to run. Do not forsake me, oh my darling. But it's only a movie, and so in number 19 slide, Kathleen will see Gary Cooper on the set of High Noon doing a trick with the gun. The people are gathered around. Flawed Crosby, the cinematographer, has his hand on the camera. He would be well known later for doing a number of those Vincent Price movies. You remember The Mask of the Red Death, The Fall of the House of Usher, those Technicolor, Vincent Pitt and the Pendulum. That would be where Floyd Crosby winded up. But before that, he was doing this kind of thing with Gary Cooper. So there's Cooper on the set. There's another one, Kathleen, of the actress Kati Harado, Grace Kelly and Gary Cooper on the set with crew members. There, you know, you've got the uh, maid, I guess you'd call her, manicurist, all-purpose assistant to uh, Grace Kelly and Kati Harado in the background, clinical nurse, etc. Next one, Cooper takes a nap during the break in the filming of High Noon. Take my word for it, there's Gary Cooper with his feet up, okay? And his very nice vehicle. So a major example of illusion and reality. One more. The next one is lunch on the set. I have Grace Kelly, Gary Cooper, Floyd Crosby next to Grace Kelly, that same cinematographer. All had to be fed and transported, and that's what happened in the movies. We never saw that, of course, in the movie, but... We'll now return to the original image, Kathleen. This puts us back where we started. This is the way we see it in the movie. We don't see Cooper relaxing on the set. We don't see the commissary. We don't see any of that. We know it's there. 
We put it out of our mind. We suspend our disbelief. And we're right there with that clock ticking away for duty, honor, and responsibility at high noon. I move next as we head to the conclusion for uh, to Shane, released by Paramount a year after high noon. We're now looking at this poster, 1953. Lots of good actors in it. They get credit on the poster. The um, poster pretty accurately reflects the movie. But let's go on to the set of Shane for a moment with our next shot. Here we are at the Grand Tetons. Cinematographer Loyal Griggs is the man who will win the Academy Award for cinematography for Shane. Now it's in color. Our image here is in black and white. Loyal Griggs, the cinematographer, those are the miracle makers of the movies, in my opinion, especially the West when they could photograph the Grand Tetons and so forth. Loyal Griggs has a hat on in this. He has a checkered shirt. He's at the right. And notice something else interesting at the right. There's a little boy sitting there. You see the little boy at the right? Down there past Loyal Griggs on the extreme right of the photo. That is not Brandon DeWilda. That's his stunt double. Okay? Every, he's dressed just like Brandon DeWilda, who would be running after Shane saying, Shane, come back. This is a little kid who is not Brandon DeWilda, but he's the one who did the heavy running. So in Shane, when there's a kid that runs, you know, he runs through the river and he's running and the dog is running with him, unless you get a frontal shot of Brandon DeWilla, it's this kid, all right? The movies are in the business of fooling us, and they even use doubles, of course, for all the hard stuff. We're almost through with this, and we'll come to our point, but I want to still, I can't resist behind-the-scenes shots. And the next one is of the director, George Stevens, at work on Shane. The great actress, Jean Arthur, whose last movie was Shane, she played Van Heflin's wife, said that Paramount didn't understand what they were getting when they hired George Stevens. He made exactly one Western, unless you count Giant as a modern Western. He made a lot of other movies, a lot of comedies in the 30s and 40s. He made movies that went on like The Diary of Anne Frank, for example, very limited space, but he did this Western. And what Gene Arthur said was, Paramount gave this a lower budget, though they did give it color, because they thought it was an Alan Ladd movie. It wasn't an Alan Ladd movie. It was a George Stevens movie, she said. And here is George Stevens throwing a punch, showing an assistant director and Alan Ladd how he wants to have that fight scene in Grafton Saloon near the start of the picture where Ladd will be fighting with the actor Ben Johnson. And so he got right in there. You can see the artificial lights. You can tell that that is a set. And as a Hollywood studio, they are not out in the Grand Tetons at this time. But you can see how all that works and how they make you think that's where they are. Stevens was capable of doing almost anything to get the shot he wanted. And in this next slide, Stevens is on a trolley lining up a shot. <laughs> Look at that. Now, remember, we're dealing with what you could do. This movie's made in 51, by the way, but not released until 53, when it was then eligible for 53 nominations. They didn't know if they should release it or not. Stevens worked on it a long time in the editing room. Finally, they released it. Huge popular success, and in many people's book, the number one Western of all time. You see Alan Ladd in his buckskin at the left and Stevens lining up the shot. Now let's go to our final slide for tonight, Kathleen. We're back to the final image. We're back where we started. Alan Ladd back in his classic pose. And you see him there with a the rope and the gun, and most of all, the enigmatic smile and a performance of a lifetime that George Stevens coaxed out of Ladd. You can almost hear the last dialogue as he rides away. Shane, the little boy says, come back, Shane. Remember that? Repeatedly, come back. And then, since we've had this sexual tension throughout the movie between Jean Arthur and Alan Ladd, and it's underwritten, you don't know whether she's known him from the past, whether he came there to reclaim her, found her married, stumbled upon the place, never met her before. You don't know, but the little boy will say, Dad has chores for you, and Mother wants you. I know she does. Come back, come back, Shane, but he doesn't. And to the groundswell of music, the hero rides out of the valley, having dispatched duty, honor, and responsibility. It is no longer a valley he can comfortably live in.
At the end of high noon, Harry Cooper throws the badge in the dirt and leaves town. Having discharged duty, honor, and responsibility, he can't live there anymore. The man who shot Liberty Valance, we know by now, not spoiling it, John Wayne is the character who actually shot Lee Marvin, and he, of course, goes on a tear, gets drunk, becomes a very obscure person, no longer comfortable in town, on and on and on. Even in the B Westerns, you ride off to the next adventure. In the TV Westerns, Cheyenne goes to the next adventure. Now to wrap this up, there are some transitional pictures we should briefly discuss that bring us out of the classic period to the modern to see and the contemporary to see whether Westerns endure. Clint Eastwood made a uh, fistful of dollars in Italy in 1964. It was con considered violent and controversial and they weren't sure whether this character exhibited duty, honor, and responsibility, so it held up until 1967, a release three years later. The Wild Bunch, where the violence is very strong, directed by Sam Peckinpah, a well-regarded Western by some, it's a matter of taste, I think, the violence is very strong, came out in 1968, just as the classic era was ending. To remind you of some dates, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, hugely popular. The B-movies have by now fallen by the wayside. They're no longer made. After the classic period, the last B-series Western, if anybody asks you for a trivia quiz, an actor named Wayne Morris in his series of Westerns, and the movie was Two Guns and a Badge. And that is the last series Western. Roy was through with them. Gene was through with them. Hoppy was through with them. And only Wayne Morris carried us to the conclusion. Then Blazing Saddles in 1974, again, hugely popular, and I guess you have to count it as a Western. All the TV reruns, and think for a minute, if you will, of the adaptations back and forth. 310 to Yuma is made in 57. Later, James Mangell makes Copland with Sylvester Stallone. It is the 310 to Yuma plot brought up to the 1990s. Then James Mangell, the same person, makes the 310 to Yuma remake in the 21st century, okay? And redoes the ending and so forth. Broken Lance with Spencer Tracy, formerly House of Strangers by Philip Yordan, both plays. Same plot. One is in a Western setting, one isn't. Sean Connery in Outland, the great Sean Connery. You remember that movie where he's out all alone on the space station fighting duty, honor, and responsibility, a virtual remake of High Noon. So we have to think about the way these go back and forth across the genres. There are authors still read these days. Elmore Leonard, Luke Short, Max Brand, Louis L'Amour, Elmer Keaton, Robert B. Parker, John Jakes, they still sell. Whether they've passed on or still writing, they still sell. And some modern and contemporary Westerns that have succeeded greatly, but they're few and far between, Silverado did okay business in 1985. Might remember that with Kevin Costner and many others. Dances with Wolves, 1990, Kevin Costner really takes the position of sympathy toward the Native American. Won the Academy Award, huge financial hit. 1992, Unforgiven, Clint Eastwood wins the Academy Award, huge financial hit. 2003, Open Range, again with Kevin Costner and Robert Duvall, not so much liked by the critics, big financial success. 2007, the remake of 310 to Yuma makes some money. That same year, critical success, but no real money, goes to a movie with the longest Western title possible, The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. But at least Casey Affleck, got an Academy Award nomination for playing the coward Robert Ford, and the movie had great cinematography, and it did get a following, but not a popular following. 2008, Appaloosa, remember that one? Robert B. Parker, very successful Western. We showed it at the library series, even with a spaghetti dinner, because it was our version of an Italian Western uh, at the library a few years ago. And finally, I guess I'll mention the last one that was hugely successful, 10 Oscar nominations, was the remake of True Grit with Jeff Bridges in the role and closer to the book and the novel than it had been in the John Wayne version. As some people said, the 
first one in 69 was a John Wayne movie. This one was an adaptation of the novel. So in conclusion, the appeal of duty, honor, and responsibility still seems to be very strong. The lights may burn low for a while, and people may seem all out for themselves. But if you go back to like Brokaw's The Greatest Generation, you find duty, honor, and responsibility on every page. And that from World War II, when the Westerns were in their heyday, up to the present, still has a place in modern society, still revered by many people. And so I argue that the Western still perseveres in different locations, different themes, and under different disguises. Is this a Western, really? Avatar, Black Panther, Spider-Man. Think about it. Are we still making Westerns? You bet we are, <laughs> okay. It's just that these are more like classic Westerns than they are like any other genre. The Western genre, says Paul Simpson in the British Rough Guide to Westerns, the Western genre created a powerful fantasy of a clear-cut world where the individual could still make all the difference. And, to quote Robert Redford's character again, if that's too highfalutin for you, I like Westerns. I don't know that they're about anything. I just like them. And as long as duty, honor, responsibility, and just plain affection for them will resonate, the Western may be in remission. It may from time to time, like now, be in a low ebb. It may go undercover. It may be out of fashion. It may be disguised as another genre altogether. But it's with us, and I think it will prevail, and definitely it will and should endure. Thank you very much. Well, Jack, it's interesting that you uh, mentioned Tom Brokaw because this is one of the questions that came through for you. It seems to me that a lot of the values you describe also pertain to military movies, particularly World War II. So do you think Westerns paved the way or vice versa? No, I don't think it's paved the way or vice versa. I think they were contemporaneous. You know, there was a while, as, as your, I won't try to over-answer this, but your question uh, asker may know that there was a while right after World War II when audiences would not tolerate any World War II movies. There were a couple of years Hollywood didn't produce a single one because people had had enough of the conflict then in 49, they broke through with Sands of Iwo Jima. They had had one or two small ones before that. And then that was, excuse me, successful again, so on they went. But to the question, there are a lot of similarities. There certainly are a lot of similarities. The duty, the honor, the responsibility, you can find those in science fiction. You can find them anywhere. I think it's heavily concentrated in the Western, as it is in the World War II movie. But what happened to the Western? Why did it go into decline? Your question asker is right on target. After the greatest generation and after World War II, something happened to the Western that critics agree on very important. Not only did the generation die off that could remember living then, in 1965, if you were born in 1890, you could remember something about it and you'd have been only 75 years old, right? In 1945, if you were 85, you were still alive, born during the Civil War, or shortly before. The generation died off, of course, that knew the West as it was, or as the Westerns pretended it was. And then what happened? The big event, not to tease you any further, Vietnam. That's what most critics think happened. People were watching... CBS and ABC and NBC bring horrific scenes into the room every night, and duty, honor, and responsibility became a little confused in people's minds. The protests, the opposition to the draft, all of that that happened. We're not taking a position on that. I'm just saying critics think that that broke the cord and severed the Western from its moorings, and we no longer really had the same thing afterwards. And then sure enough, Vietnam era, that's where you get the Ballad of Cat Ballou, Waterhole Number 3, 74 Blazing Saddles. You see where I'm going with that. Things changed. And so the room for the Western has to be revived and put in a different context or disguise. Another question? Uh, Jack, I, uh, you, you were talking about the, the comedies, which I think you would generally consider as 
as B Western movies. Uh, depends. And uh, yeah, well, Blazing Saddles was certainly a big hit. Yeah. And and I loved Three Amigos. <laughs> that, that was that was hilarious. But I and a lot of the B movies, in fact, almost all of them, you usually had a comic character yes. somewhere there, yes. like Wishbone or yep. uh, those kind of characters, but not in the A movies like uh, High Noon. And, That's and they, they're much more serious, and they always had a little levity in those. And and uh, uh, was was it just to try to broaden the audience, or was it to uh, put a stamp on it as a B movie? <laughs> no, there are three or four. That's a great observation, and that's absolutely true. You had the A movies, which, uh, like Gary Cooper, there are a couple of moments of humor here and there in High Noon, as there are in Shane, but it isn't Ritz contextual humor. It's not kind of somebody being a goofball type of humor. But all of those people had their sidekicks. Gene Autry had Pat Buttram, and Roy Rogers had a number of them, Andy Devine and Gabby Hayes, and Hopalong Cassidy had Gabby Hayes and Edgar Buchanan, and we can go on and on. And these people were sidekicks. Pat Buttram said, you know what it meant to be a sidekick? It meant when they were filming a movie, they smoothed the way. They smoothed the way for the star. He's riding down on that horse like Gene riding on Champion. He got a smooth way in front of him. I'm the sidekick. I'm in the gopher holes, and I'm in the tumbleweeds, and I'm doing the best I can. And if I fall off my horse, that's not a mistake. That's funny. (laughs) So, yes, they had that kind of B-picture humor. Part of it, to extend the running time to get to an hour. Second of it, because kids were watching those movies. And so you would throw some extra humor in for the kids. So you had Fuzzy St. John and all these people. You can kind of dimly or very well remember some of them. And they would provide their antics and a little bit of a subplot. And so you'd have an hour's worth of things going on. Maybe you had 45 minutes of action and 15 of goofing around, you know. So good point, good point. Now, you didn't find those sidekicks in very many unless it was for deliberate comic relief Somewhere along, like, well, I can give you examples. Cat Blue, where you have Nat King Cole and Stubby K singing as a chorus, remember? Singing the ballad and that kind of thing, but not real sidekicks in A movies. Next question. Well, that you mentioned that about singing along. The question that came in is, what could you tell us about musical westerns? Other than Blazing Saddles? Which is technically a musical western. With well, the actually, that was, the, that was the other question. Comment on Blazing Saddles. So I guess those two go together. Uh, the only thing to say about Blazing Saddles is Mel Brooks gave an interview on that recently when the movie was revived. And he, the interviewer said, would you agree with the passage of time that Blazing Saddles is in bad taste? And Brooks said, of course it's in bad taste. That's the whole point of it. It's supposed to be. That's why it's funny. So they can poke fun at all kinds of things, bodily functions and things that you normally would not bring up in a movie, and they make it uh, funny. It's so outrageous, you just have to laugh at it. There's no way to avoid it. You can't. It's the old thing I learned uh, when I was a student at the University of South Dakota, and the professor said, you know, if you want to get a laugh, you can get a laugh by just making something incongruous. All you have to do, Dr. Knutson said, was have Hamlet doing his soliloquy while a janitor drags a toilet seat across the back of the stage. <laughs> You'll get a laugh. That's Blazing Saddles. There was, the music, the pop, there was the popularity of the singing cowboy, however. That's right, and not just the singing cowboy, but I think the question was musicals. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, there was the singing cowboy, even John Wayne tried that. <laughs> And Dick Ferran and all of them, they tried that. But, and they were, that was a lot of that, and it was very popular. But musicals, I think, I think of the uh, epitome to me, there are others, of the best Western musical that I like is Oklahoma. Here you have duty, honor, responsibility, and a straightforward plot, but you also have with it a lot of great music and, and vistas, even though the film was shot in Arizona, because Oklahoma by that time was too crowded to get good shots. But Oklahoma would be a primary example. Paint Your Wagon is another example. You can think of many more. Seven Brides for Seven Brothers is an example of the 
a musical, large-scale Western, and all of those have a place, and I think they're a, a good subgenre. You know, you have, in any book you go to, there's a new book the library has just gotten with Brad Pitt on the cover as Jesse James and the assassination of Jesse James, and the library is processing this book. It's very good. And in that book, the man talks about all the subgenres available. If you don't want to do that, go to Google Western genre, and they'll give you dozens of subgenres. The spaghetti Western, the musical Western, the this Western, the that Western, the Japanese Western, and so forth, the film noir Western, and you can go through all of those. But if you're a fan of musicals, if the question asker is a fan of musicals, and you haven't re recently seen it, Take a look at Oklahoma because it's not only a good... And why that's a good Western? It's directed by Fred Zinneman. I think the director is a lot of the story. And he directed High Noon. And so Oklahoma comes across with its serious side and its less serious side. Next question. My understanding is that, that High Noon had something to do with the McCarthy hearings. Can you That's, comment on that? Yes, it did. Carl Foreman, who uh, wrote the script from a story uh, from the Saturday Evening Post by, I think, John Cunningham. I'm not sure of that. But Carl Foreman wrote the script, and he was blacklisted. That was about the last movie that he got uh, screen credit for for a while, and then he went to England. Um, did a very good job with that script. It got involved in there because he wanted to make some social points about one man standing alone against innuendo, gossip, and so forth. So he did have a story in there, uh, a sub-storyline, you might say, about how one person could stand up against the town. And if you want, you can use that as an analogy, and you can do that, and you can read that in. You don't have to know that, though, in order to enjoy the movie as a Western, conforming to all of the genre. Hero wins, prevails against impossible odds, uses his wits and his gun to get out of the situation, and then, as I say, leaves the town because he can't be there anymore. Um, you, you can certainly make that interpretation, but it isn't necessary to make that interpretation. Now, Howard Hawks and John Wayne did not like that movie very much because they didn't think a marshal like that to be a true hero would have asked for help. Remember, Cooper goes around asking everybody in town if they'll stand with him. It's part of the plot, and nobody will, and nobody will. They've all got their reasons. I've got a family, whatever. They won't stand with him. And that shows how weak some people were who wouldn't stand up to the McCarthy hearings and the House Un-American Activities Committee. And that's undoubtedly part of his point. But Howard Hawks said... I don't like that. What we want is a man standing alone facing the whole town. It doesn't matter how many are against him. He might have one or two assistants, but that's it. And so they did their version a few years later, Rio Bravo. Or if you think about it, a friend, Ward Bond, tries to help and gets killed for his trouble, right? And it really leaves, besides a few townspeople like Pedro Gonzalez Gonzalez and Estelita Rodriguez at the hotel, it really only leaves Ricky Nelson, Dean Martin, Walter Brennan, and John Wayne, and then with Angie Dickinson's assistants to thwart the plot of all these bad guys. And then they thought that was more appropriate, you know, and they didn't like. Well, of course, John Wayne and Howard Hawks had a different opinion during the McCarthy hearings, too, than some of Hollywood did. So, yeah, that's there, but not necessarily there. Yeah. Hi. This is a question that came from our friend Maggie Thompson on Facebook. Um, how about a more extended shout-out for the stunting performers? Consider that two guys actually jumped off the cliff in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, 1969. We know what was involved. On the other hand, Andy Devine did drive the team in Stagecoach. Yes. <laughs> he did drive the team. In, good question, Maggie. Maggie is uh, really an expert on stunts and stunt men and stunt people and uh, very, very knowledgeable about that. So good question. Yes, a shout-out to the stuntmen for sure. Remember I mentioned George O'Brien was a stuntman and an extra before he got picked up to be in the Iron Horse. And they did tremendous things, particularly, they, you know, Yakima Canute, David Sharp. These were wonderful, talented people who kind of risked their lives 
to bring across certain special effects in a day long before graphics and CGI, right? So they did a tremendous job. And yes, Andy Devine drove the coach. And as I'm sure Maggie knows, and some of you may know, Walter Brennan for certain scenes drove the wagon for the chow wagon in Red River. And in order to prove it in Red River, there's the scene where they're going across the river and Howard Hawks has him turn around on some pretext so you can see it's not a body double, it's Walter Brennan, who actually has the reins of that wagon going across that river. And, uh, you know, the man, I think that was Canute, Maggie can correct me if I'm wrong, but who dropped down between the horses in stagecoach and then went to the back under the stagecoach, and he, Ford had him get up to show that he was all right, that it had really been done, that it wasn't a dummy, it wasn't a bag of rags, it was a real man that had that happen, and that's the kind of thing those guys did. Canute also played Indians in the same movie in the same scenes, but, he, you know, fall off horse, <laughs> all that kind of thing. Yes, Maggie's right. A real shout-out in this genre of all genres, particularly indebted to those guys, almost all guys, some women. Anybody else? Are we down to the down to the nubbins? I just want to thank the Winchester Academy again and all the people I thanked at the beginning. One of the things I know we all hope for is that one day the COVID will get cleared up and we can go back to regular programming. But in the interim, I think it's, I'm not, this is a plug, I wasn't asked to say this. To me, I think it's a marvelous thing that the Winchester Academy has decided not to be daunted by this, to go forward, to do something virtual, and to bring people something of the many people around here who have some knowledge, some story to tell, and keep that Winchester Academy spirit going over the airwaves, over Facebook, and on the radio. Thanks to all of you for listening, and until next week from the Winchester Academy, good night.